Some would consider this a physical change because it's dissolving. Some would consider this to be a chemical change because it's a Lewis acid base reaction. Some would consider this to be a chemical change because there's a color change. Some would consider this to be a chemical change because it's a new substance form. Some would consider it to be a physical change because it's reversible. Some would be considering this a chemical change because there's bonds broken and remade. Same type of dissolving, but all of a sudden a lot of those arguments change when we put sugar in instead of a salt. And then although it's a very, very similar process, this would be more regarded as a chemical change, even though it's the same thing happening. So why do we even bother? Here's a good particle representation of that first demonstration. Here we have copper chloride solid going into water and dissolving. A lot of people articulate that as a physical change because they assume that these don't change. What they're not aware of is the fact that this copper ion is actually surrounded by water particles in a pretty constrained manner that we can consider it a new chemical substance. In fact, we could say that it is a copper aqua complex ion and that's a Lewis acid base reaction. Here, we have copper undergoing the same transition, but instead of being surrounded by water particles that I haven't drawn here, it's being surrounded by ammonia. And because of that obvious color change to that royal blue that we formed a new chemical substance, people will assign this as a chemical change and this as a, as a physical change, even though the electronic process between them is identical. This is the electrons on the nitrogen and the ammonia are interacting with the copper. This is the electrons on the oxygen of the water are interacting with the copper. What would be better is if we were to actually look at what's happening at this level and look at the electronics of this and look at what the particle changes are and the energy changes, rather than trying to characterize this is physical and this is chemical or this is chemical and this is chemical, we get nothing out of the assignment of physical and chemical to these. Here in part five, I want to look at the chemical change, physical change distinctions that we talk about in education. Uh, in, in middle school and high school, I want to look at, in my opinion, this is just something that has no purpose to being taught whatsoever. And I don't understand why it initially was brought into curriculums and why it continues to linger in curriculums. Now, when we talk about physical and chemical changes, typically, what people are doing is they're separating out chemical reactions from any other change of substances, right? And how do they distinguish that? They don't go through and highlight that there are three different types of chemical reactions that all involve charged particles changing. So for instance, redox is a branch of chemical reactions where electrons are transferred between substances. Either they move closer to one particular component or actual bonds chain where electrons are involved in becoming closer to something that's a little more electronegative or a little less electronegative. Uh, acid base, the bronze to the Bauer level, is about the motion of protons, H plus ions. Uh, but really, when we get into the Lewis level, it's again about the change in electrons. So it's about having an electron change its interaction to another substance. So currently I have you know, a nitrogen with a lone pair, and then that nitrogen forms an interaction with the boron, and therefore there is a change with those charged particles. And the last kind is the one that really kind of takes this whole thing and messes up everything. And that is precipitation. So that is taking two different types of ions in solution, and a double replacement reaction occurs, and one of the ions from one solution and one of the ions from another solution form a precipitate, and we have cations and anions that are changing their positioning and changing their interactions, and therefore that is a chemical reaction. So every chemical reaction that occurs is one of those three things. So if you have a synthesis, a decomposition, it'll fit into one of those categories. If you're in organic chemistry and you do a synthesis, every reaction is always about this because it's always about the motion of charged particles. Instead of teaching that chemical reactions are about charged particles changing their positioning and changing what they're you know, next to, we just instead flood students with a whole bunch of observations without really anything to formulate. And so we give them this chemical physical change, but that's not a good decision. It would be much better to avoid giving them something that's kind of faulty. Now, when people talk about chemical changes, they use terms like irreversible, new substances formed, bonds broken or formed, energy changes, or some variation on this. 
So a lot of people will say things like there's a color change, there's a gas produced, there's a odor change, there's some kind of physical appearance change that indicates this. The problem with these is that none of these actually work all the time, and all of these work for both. So there are chemical changes that are irreversible, and there are chemical changes that are highly reversible. Acid-base reactions are incredibly reversible. There are chemical reactions that occur where a new substance is formed, and then there's a chemical reactions where that's not exactly the case in a way that distinguishes it from physical changes. There are chemical reactions that involve bonds breaking and being formed very frequently, um, but there's some where intermolecular forces change, and the actual change to the self is based on the electronic structure of the different particles involved. Uh, there are energy changes in both chemical and physical changes about. about. And I also want to point out that this one in particular people assume is exclusive to chemical change when it's really not. So if I take an ionic compound and I hit that with a hammer and it shatters into pieces, the majority of people assume that that's a physical change. But if I actually look at what's happening, I'm separating particles out from each other, which means that I'm actually breaking bonds as I do that. Even if I melt this, if I were to melt a salt, what I'm doing is I'm breaking the interactions between these particles that are bonds. And so salts and metals are all connected particle by particle using bonds. And so this is actually a terrible way to distinguish because it focuses really only on what's going on here and sometimes here, and completely ignores this, which sets a student up for an improper ability to go through a later time in chemistry and really be able to give a deep analysis of what a chemical reaction is. So we have these kind of guidelines that we use. My problem is they lead to very poor discussion because they're faulty. So when we get to a point that's complicated where we can get into a discussion on, well, what are the electronic changes? You know, is it an intermolecular force change? Is it a chemical bond change? Should that matter? We avoid all of that. Instead, we do things like, well, did we see a new color? Okay, we saw a new color, but I want to say it's a physical change because I've always said dissolving is a physical change or dissolving is a chemical change. And so the discussion we get is so limited because it's restricted by these arbitrary rules that are inconsistent. And so when we go through, what are we actually teaching students when we do these chemical physical change analyses? And then at the end of this, I assume that most teachers would say that the reason why we do chemical physical changes is a learning objective. We're trying to get students to do analysis of what's going on at the particle level, which I, I like that. This is just not the good means to do that. What would be a better means to do that would be to not characterize anything and not say that melting is going to be grouped with vaporization or that melting is different than precipitation, but rather to look at melting and go, what's going on in melting? And then we can compare that with a specific example, but there's no need to link these two things to some middle ground difference. We say, ah, melting fits into this category and precipitation fits into this, because it just doesn't add anything to that discussion. If we want students to look at what melting is and have a solid understanding of that, we should look at what melting is and have a solid understanding of that. Adding the physical change to that gives the student the ability to go, oh, I know that melting is a physical change, so therefore I think I have an understanding of it, when they really have not done any analysis on what's going on with my charged particles, what's going on with my particles in these particular changes. They can go through and do analysis of what are the energy changes, are there bonds being broken and formed, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Is there a new substance form would be a great discussion. Is a liquid of a substance different from the solid of the substance? You know, are the particles the same or different? And there's a lot to that discussion. It's not as obvious or as simple as people would make it out to be. So at the end of the day, I feel like the learning objectives behind doing a physical chemical change just routinely fall short. They end up being a thing where a teacher's discretion is used to categorize different things. Even if you look at the first three examples there, there are tons of disagreements on whether those are chemical physical changes, even though the time that the uh, salt was dissolved is an acid base, Lewis acid base reaction, at least for the copper, and the inverse of a precipitation reaction, essentially. And the last one is also an acid base, and I believe a redox as well. And so people will put that as a chemical, uh, even though they're the same thing, they're dissolving. And so so kind of dissolving is a great example to go through and highlight the fact that that's an acid-base reaction always, and occasionally a redox reaction as well, where you're getting electron positioning changes. And, and therefore, what do you do with that? A lot of teachers are telling students that dissolving is a physical change because it's irreversible. And so what really is the point of the teacher who distinguishes it as this versus the teacher who does it as this? A better discussion would be 
what actually happens when something dissolves. What can we infer and what can we see in terms of evidence of that? At the higher level, I've never seen anything where someone at the higher level needs to come through and go, ah, yes, I have a great realization, I have this new discovery, and I attributed it to the fact that we have this chemical versus physical distinction. There's no need when you're doing an organic synthesis to stop and go, well, hold on, is this substitution reaction a chemical change or a physical change? The level of specificity grows so far beyond this that this distinction becomes irrelevant. So what we have is, we have something where the learning is, is destructive or inhibited by this physical chemical change assignment. And there's no end game where if you were to go into a career that you would need to use this lingo. No one's going to use chemical change or physical change to distinguish between some high level work at a PhD level chemistry analysis. And so there's no end game for this. And then we're also missing that a lot of these physical changes get grouped where melting is taught as the same thing as vaporization, when really there could be some key differences between what's going on in this and what's going on in this that a student will then gloss over and miss because of that categorization. So I guess at the end of the day, I don't feel like there's any end game where something purposeful comes out of this distinction. I feel like it negatively impacts the learning involved by restricting the discussion and also adding an element of disingenuousness to the discussion. And so therefore, I don't understand why this continues to be taught and what the purpose is that teachers are using that for, or I guess, more critically, that perhaps the purpose intended is not what actually happens in the classroom.